whenever you're ready, Lionel, you go ahead. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, we'll get started here uh, for uh, June the 6th here for Growing Concerns. Uh, today we're going to, I'm going to go through a little bit of an update as usual. And then we have uh, two guests today. We have uh, John Gabowski, who's going to give us a little bit of an insect update. Uh, we've been getting a few calls regarding uh, some insects out there that are creating some interest. So uh, I thought it'd be good if John can maybe give us a little bit of an update on those. Uh, then uh, also uh, I'm getting some questions regarding black lighting canola. So I figured it'd be good if uh, Holly could come on the line and uh, and give us a little bit of an update on black leg and uh, how we should be treating uh, this this issue. So uh, I guess with that uh, I'll get started with the uh, the update. And uh, I guess one of the first uh, things I've been getting a lot of calls on this this uh, this past week, anyways, uh, and and beginning of this week, is uh, is canola and issues with canola emergence and uh, and just the whole fact of how many plants do I need to um, have a crop and and so forth. And a lot of the issues I'm seeing in the fields is. Uh, I guess one of the main ones is guys have been planting too deep, and mainly because of a couple issues. A couple is because uh, we're probably not used to sowing into uh, a lot of work land, and a lot of guys were just seeding at the normal depth that they normally would sow their canola, and finding that because the land had been worked uh, last fall and and maybe this spring, uh, that uh, some of those fields are softer than they normally would be. And we're finding that they're putting uh, seed down, you know, three inches in the soil, and uh, it's just having a harder time making it through. The other one is uh, there were some guys that planted, uh, you know, just a couple weeks ago, and some of that seed is still sitting in dry soil and was needing a rain to get it going, and we just haven't had enough showers uh, through some of those areas to uh, to get it going. And uh, then uh, in a couple of cases, we've had some flea beetle damage where plants have just sat for so long and not have got, got going. And then when they finally did get going, uh, we're seeing um, plants numbers are, are stand being reduced by flea beetles. Uh, I guess one other thing, I was in another field the, uh, the yesterday, day before yesterday, and uh, that field there uh, was hail damage and uh, it was uh, the producer was concerned if he had enough plants left over after the hail damage we had a couple of strips of, of pretty high intense hail that uh, came through the area did some uh, fairly good damage to canola as well as some of the uh, wheat and oats crops knocking them down pretty good but uh, most of them are pretty much all of them I've been in are all coming back uh, there's a new growth coming on all of them whether it be the cereal crops or the canola, we're seeing new growth come come out. So um, I guess those issues aren't going to be too big of a problem there. Getting back to the uh, the uh, canola stands and uh, the questions we've been getting, and uh, I think the, well, the to get to your best yield or your better better uh, better stands, you always kind of aim for that seven to eleven uh, plants per square foot. But uh, that would be for kind of optimum conditions. Um, we have seen canola make it from two to three plants per square foot. And uh, that would be the biggest thing is going out and, and making counts and seeing if the plants, uh, there's enough plants there. You got to remember we have gone into June now and uh, reseeding uh, and reseeding back to canola may not uh, produce as good a stand or good as yield as uh, you would get from keeping the stand you have. So that's the, the big judgment call there. So, uh, you know, if you've got two to, uh, maybe two is on the low side, but three to five plants per square feet, you know, a situation like that might be something worthwhile leaving. As, uh, you know, it's maybe not not as perfect a stand, but if you, uh, with the, the varieties we have now, whether it be the Liberties or the the Roundup tolerant or glyphosate like tolerant varieties, uh, you know, we can keep those fields fairly clean. And uh, as long as we can keep them clean and we get uh, some timely rains, those crops could still produce uh, optimum yields. Uh, 
leaving uh, the uh, canola thing and getting over to uh, the winter wheat. Um, some winter wheat's uh, a little bit more advanced. Uh, some of that I was in a field actually yesterday that was actually uh, the, the heads were were, head, uh, were, were probably 50% out already, which was probably the most advanced field I've seen. But a lot of the fields are in this stage right now where the flag leaf is there, it's standing straight up, and fungicide application timing is, is really, really close right now. So the decision producers are going to need to make is whether they want to spray for or disease control or spray for fusarium control and then once they decide that then they need to determine the timing so uh, again depending on what you're looking at for uh, for we can are for disease control uh, um, for you know just leaf control once the flag leaf uh, starts to turn down where uh, you'll begin better coverage uh, which in this case is probably going to be later on this week uh, producers would be spraying these fields. If you're going to be waiting for fusarium control, you'd be waiting for the head to start emerging and uh, just before flowering. So in that case, you probably have, you know, probably to the middle of next week. One thing to remember is that uh, crop is growing fairly fast, and if we get some warm conditions like they've been mentioning, uh, and we've gotten over the last couple of days, we sure notice a difference in stands from a day-to-day -day period. This is a, a spring a cereal, a spring wheat crop, and uh, I mentioned, uh, we talked a bit about um, some, a couple of the previous uh, webinars regarding um, timing of application of herbicide and also uh, tank mixing and uh, we're running into are getting a few calls this past week regarding crop injury on on uh, on several different uh, different issues and uh, I guess one of the things is uh, when we're 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 doing a tank mix and we're 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 doing more than just the herbicide we're also throwing in a, uh, a fertilizer as well as a fungicide, we have to be cautious as to the uh, growing conditions at the time and, uh, and the damage or the crop tolerance issues that may, be, uh, may, may, be, may become a factor because uh, when you do start adding uh, other products to your, uh, your normal herbicide uh, mix, you can heat up those products and cause more injury to the crop. So, um, I was in fields uh, the last couple of days where producers were concerned just about the, um, just mainly concerned about their, uh, the crop is yellowing and, uh, and what, uh, you know, what, what can be done or if they did something wrong and, and basically all of the, what they did wrong or, you know, what happened this year as compared to other years is uh, the chemical and the growing, growing conditions are good chemicals working good and then they heated it up by adding uh, another sticker like a fertilizer or a uh, fungicide so basically the chemical stays on the plant for a longer period of time and because of that it, it takes longer for that plant to break down the, uh, the chemical and that's why we're seeing more crop injury than we normally would see. In pretty much 99% of the cases of the fields I've been in uh, you definitely see uh, new plant uh, growth, and so it's it's more like uh, just a, a stampede type effect. If we remember back when we used to be using stampede as a chemical, and it would be uh, spray and leave it uh, for a week and don't go back because otherwise you'll be really discouraged as to the what the crop looks like. But uh, in most of these cases, the crop is coming back. The next slide here is uh, a weed that uh, guy got sent to me this past week, and uh, I'm not 100% sure what it is, so I wanted to put it on the webinar today just to see if anybody else has some ideas on it. Uh, it was sent to me by uh, the FDA, uh, Dennis Lang uh, sent it to me, and um, I uh, did some looking, and I couldn't identify it from the picture. You could see it's uh, it's actually came from a fairly good depth, so it's got a fairly strong uh, root system or it's able to establish. And uh, so if anybody has any ideas uh, when we're through the webinar today, if they would like to 
let us know so we can let everybody know or if uh, you know uh, if, uh, if you figure it out during the week if you could uh, let us know by email that would be great as well. And again, just a couple more pictures of the, the tank mixes and uh, some of the yellowing we were seeing in the crop. You could see that the new growth was coming and, uh, and definitely coming back. So again, just, uh, just set the crop back. And you wouldn't want, want to be going out on a day like today or a day like yesterday when we're getting uh, highs of 28 and 29 degrees and doing the same type of mixes because the injury is definitely going to be a lot more. And also just to remember that a lot of the products, once the temperatures get this hot, uh, recommendations for spraying uh, some of the products is not, uh, for good crop tolerances, it's not recommended. So with that, uh, the brief crop update, I'm going to ask Linda to switch it over to John Gavosky. And I'm going to get John to um, talk about a couple of the insect issues. Okay, uh, you can hear me okay, Linda? Yes, we can hear you, John. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, I'll kick it off here then. Okay, um, I'm going to focus on leaf hoppers for my presentation today just because um, numbers of one particular species are quite high this year, and I've been getting a lot of questions on leaf hoppers, so I'll try to address some of the uh, the more common questions I've been getting. But just as a uh, brief intro to leafhoppers, uh, when we talk about leafhoppers, there's a lot of species of leafhoppers out there. Uh, and here's some stats in the uh, first slide here. In Manitoba, we've got over 350 types of leafhoppers. And worldwide, there's actually over 20,000 species. And just to let you know how abundant that is, there's roughly 10,000 species of birds worldwide. So there's a uh, about twice as many species of, of leafhoppers as there are species of birds, just to put it in perspective. So lots of species of leafhoppers. We've got two species that, of those 350 in Manitoba, we've got two that can be considered pests. So there's a lot of leafhopper species out there. Most of them are not pests. They don't do any type of crop damage. Um, the only time we have a problem is when either potato leafhopper or aster leafhopper is in uh, much higher than normal numbers. And what we've seen this year is uh, aster leafhopper has moved in early in some higher than normal numbers. And that's what's creating the issues. Uh, just to give you a bit of a background on this leafhopper, the picture on your left shows the adult stage. Uh, this is sometimes also called the six-spotted leafhopper, and they call it six-spotted because of these spots on the head. Uh, you've, there's two, I call them two dots and four dashes on the head. That's what makes up the six spots, and that's how they get their name, and that's how you can tell them from other types of leafhoppers that might be in your crops. Uh, this is something, though, that you probably need a magnifying glass to be able to see easily in the field. When you catch them, unless you've got really good eyes, uh, it might be hard to see those dots. The uh, young stage, what you see on your right here, uh, they're little kind of uh, yellow uh, nymphs. They can't fly. They just hop around a lot. And often when you disturb them on the leaves, they just run sideways to the other side of the leaf. So that's how you can tell it's a leaf hopper and that it's an after leaf hopper. And to put size in perspective, they're only a few millimeters long. <coughs> Excuse me. They're not uh, very big insects. And again, when you disturb them in the field, they will be hopping around. If there's lots of them, as you walk through the field, you will see a lot of hopping going on. And if you're walking through the edge of a field, you see a lot of hopping. Again, know that they're leaf hoppers and that it's not grasshoppers, because you would deal with the two things very differently. Part of the problem with leafhoppers is really how they feed. Uh, when a leafhopper feeds on a crop, uh, first of all, they've got a, a beak almost like a mosquito beak. They don't have mandibles that they can chew leaves. They've got a beak. They pierce the plant tissue. And before they do any feeding, they inject their saliva. 
and that helps to break down um, some of the cell contents and uh, make their food easier for them to ingest. So they inject their saliva and then they suck up the sap or the cell contents. And it's really that injecting of saliva that's the problem. Uh, the, the, the little bit of sap they take from the plants is normally not an issue unless you had a year where uh, the crops were already drought stressed and you had a very heavy population of them. But the sap feeding part of it we generally don't worry about. It's more what goes into the plant through the saliva that can be the problem. And in the case of aster leaf hopper, they can spread, uh, it's called a phytoplasm. I won't use the word virus because the pathologist will give me a heck. It's technically called a phytoplasm, and it can cause some uh, disease symptoms on the plants. And I'm going to focus on cereal crops here right now. Uh, that's where people are seeing a lot of the leaf hoppers is in the cereal crop. And I guess the bottom line, in a nutshell, is we don't have economic thresholds for after leaf hoppers and cereal crops, and it's hard, really hard to predict how bad uh, the feeding will be and how bad the disease would be, so it's hard to make recommendations. They certainly can cause after yellow symptoms in cereal crops. And here's a picture of barley. This is with um, some more severe after yellow symptoms, which can look very similar to barley yellow dwarf. The two diseases often get confused in cereal crops. So once again, uh, upper leaves here are your um, barley yellow dwarf. And um, on the bottom here, you can see some yellow leaves. Again, that's what the, um, the, after, what the disease after yellows can look like in your cereal crops. And it can be very easily confused with barley yellow dwarf. Barley yellow dwarf, by the way, is spread by aphids, not leaf hoppers. And although they are moving our way, we haven't seen uh, aphids in the cereal crops uh, to any big degree yet. So uh, there, the aphids that usually infect our cereal crops, they blow in and they just haven't really arrived yet. But we do have lots of leafhoppers. So right now we're at low risk of barley yellow dwarf, higher risk of aster yellows. When I say higher, it's hard to know exactly how high things could get. Uh, the other thing that can happen in cereal crops is you get sterile heads. Um, so here's on your left a healthy uh, barley head, and the ones on your right are plants that have been infected with aster yellows, and sometimes you get some very deformed looking heads with um, sterile, they're basically sterile heads, uh, no seeds in them. Uh, you often will see some of these in a given growing season. Usually it's a low enough percentage that it's not really an economical thing. So just another symptom here. Healthy wheat head and after yellow is infected. And uh, <coughs> really, um, based on experience in Manitoba, uh, economically, after yellows has been visible, but probably of low economic concern in our cereal crops. Uh, and also in canola. Canola is the other one I haven't mentioned. Uh, back in 2007, we had a lot of leafhoppers, and we had more than normal aster yellows. A lot of the canola fields would have, uh, say, 3 to 5 percent of their um, stems infected with the aster yellows which yield-wise wasn't a big deal. But what did happen is when you drove by or walked into those fields, when the pods got heavy and the crop was starting to lean, any stem that was infected with the after yellows was standing straight up because they're lighter than all the rest. And if, say, even one in 20 stems has the disease, it looks horrible when you are driving by the field or you walk into the field. Yield-wise, it's not a big deal. It just looks bad. And that's often the case in the field crops. Things often do look a lot worse than they really are. And again, we just don't have economic thresholds in field crops. And it would be hard to know how to time a spray to really do anything in the field crops. We certainly need more research on that. Uh, where it can be highly economical is 
horticulture crops. And that's why I'm showing some carrots here. If there are uh, horticulture growers, um, potato growers even in the area, they certainly should be aware of where there are the higher aster leafhopper populations. And there would be much more incentive for the hort growers to be spraying insecticides than for the uh, cereal growers. This is uh, carrots. And what carrot growers will do when they know there's a lot of aster leafhoppers in the area, and if they know that they're highly infected, they will go on regular spray programs throughout the summer. And often weekly or every two weeks, they're putting on sprays. Uh, and even then, they end up getting some aster yellows in their crop, but it will be reduced compared to if they didn't do any spraying. In cereal crops, there's really been only one good study where they looked at the effect of insecticides on aster yellows. In this case, for the study, it was a barley crop. Uh, what they did at Ag Canada in Winnipeg, this was back in the 70s, they sprayed uh, 15 times um, starting when the barley was in the seedling stage. So every Tuesday and Thursday, they were spraying with malathion, and they had a few other insecticides, endosulfine and a few others. So they would spray every uh, twice a week for eight weeks from the seedling stage onward. They still got some aster yellows in the barley. It was certainly reduced compared to their checks. And the yield was certainly a little bit greater compared to the checks. But when you did the math and you figured out economically was it worthwhile, it wasn't. And trying to determine uh, how you would time a single spray, again, very difficult with the cereal crop. Uh, in carrots and things like that, it does pay to spray regularly. Uh, cereal crops, just not an economical option. Uh, here's a carrot with one of the symptoms from Master Yellows, the hairy roots. And that carrot would be bitter tasting as well. So again, that's why it's more of a concern in cereals. And here's another one of the problems with uh, aster leaf hoppers. Uh, they can overwinter here, but pr primarily what happens is big populations blow in. And we sometimes get uh, multiple peaks over the course of a season. The peaks are different between years as well. So what this graph is showing, a study done in the Saskatoon area from 2001 to 2003, and they were trying to show when the populations were peaking in canola fields. And what the graph does show is, again, the peaks were different in different years. And in some years, uh, such as 2001, you potentially would have multiple peaks throughout the season. So again, if by chance a person was trying to time a spray, to actually make a difference, it would be hard to know how to do it. Uh, so I, again, they're really it's, it's hard to give recommendations to growers as to what to do in field crops because there just aren't recommendations for how to manage them in the, the field crop. And whether do tank mixing an insecticide with a herbicide will do anything, it's really a hit and miss type of thing. It, Odds are it's probably not going to do much. It, you, you may get some reduction in aster yellow levels. It's hard to say for sure. It's a hit and miss thing. And uh, certainly nothing that we could go on record as recommending with confidence that there's going to be a return. So I mentioned aster leafhoppers primarily blow in. Uh, they can overwinter here in the prairies. In the egg stage, that's been determined in Manitoba. And in Saskatoon, they found that some years they can also overwinter as adults, but usually in very low numbers. Usually, uh, overwintering success isn't that great on the prairies. And primarily, what we get blows in. And once they get going, uh, we usually get four generations of them in Manitoba. A study in Saskatoon, they found two to three generations in the year they did their study, Manitoba. Again, this is very old research, but uh, four generations. So anywhere from two to four generations per year. A warm year like this, we're probably looking at four generations. And things that eat after leaf hoppers, there are some good bugs out there that will um, at least reduce the population somewhat eventually. There's a parasitic fly that um, in some years can decrease the population by up to a quarter. And there's also a parasitic wasp that, uh, again, in some years when it's abundant, 
can reduce the population by about a third. So if you get both of these things working, uh, sometimes they can help take the population down. And this was research done in Manitoba uh, directly on after leafhopper. And there are a number of predators as well for leafhoppers. Uh, damsel bugs are fast enough they can catch leafhoppers and feed on them, pirate bugs. And the, the young, um, young stages of leafhopper potentially could be eaten by things like lady beetles and lacewings as well. So there are a few good things here that might help out a little bit. So I'm going to uh, maybe end there. If you have any questions on leafhoppers or any of the other insects that I didn't cover this week, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, you are, Lionel. Hey, John. Uh, any questions, Linda? No, I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, well, uh, John, I've got uh, maybe a couple for you. Okay. Um, one of the questions I did have was, uh, will the uh, uh, leafhoppers in the cereal crops be, move into canola crops? I guess that was the biggest concern I had from producers because uh, they had wheat fields that had, they seen lots of them in and they were concerned about astrazellos in their neighboring field or, or coming right up to it with canola in it. Yeah, actually that's a really good question, Lionel. And it's actually the opposite. Uh, when leafhoppers get blown in, they settle on quite a few different crops, canola, wheat, um, vegetable crops. But they have their preferences. And le after leafhopper doesn't actually like canola, it, it's not one of its favorites. And when they did their studies in Saskatoon area, they found that they could only find adult leafhoppers in canola, not juveniles. It wasn't reproducing in canola. So what was happening is they would blow in, they'd get dumped, say, in a canola field, they'd feed for a while, and then they'd move out of the canola into the cereal crops, which are more preferred hosts, or into vegetable crops, weedy uh, um, ditches, things like that. They were moving out of the canola, not into it. So. Uh, if you do find leafhoppers in your canola later in the season, they're probably a second flush or a third flush that has blown in. They will feed for a while and then move out. So they're not going to move into canola. The ones that have been dumped there will feed for a little while and move out of it. It's not one of their preferred host plants. Okay. Uh, the other question, John, is then, uh, uh, well, four or five years ago when we had quite a bit of asters yellow in the canola, um, one question I was getting from producers, should I be concerned about sowing winter wheat into those fields? And uh, being that, I guess, the concern about uh, wheat streak mosaic, I guess. Okay, um, first of all, wheat streak mosaic is something totally different. Wheat streak mosaic is uh, caused by a mite, not a, not, the leaf hopper has no impact on that. That's a whole different issue. Uh, the leafhopper, ask the leafhopper doesn't overwinter well here, and it's not a vector of wheat streak mosaic. So uh, unless they've had uh, wheat streak mosaic in the area before, and they're not breaking that green bridge, there's no reason not to plant winter wheat, uh, just because you've had after leafhoppers. Uh, John, uh, John, I do have a question here. It really doesn't have anything to do with leafhoppers, but um, somebody has asked, can you mix Liberty and Desis for cutworms? Oh, good question. I'd have to check with our guide to crop protection. Uh, yeah, I, I better double check on that one before I get back to you. Hey, Lionel, that's okay, all the well, questions. We'll that. Good, Linda. We'll try to have that one answered before the end of the webinar here yet. Uh, I guess next we'll uh, go to uh, Holly Dirksen and uh, we'll, I guess, uh, talk a little bit about Black Lake. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks, Lionel, for inviting me to speak. Um, so, as Lionel indicated, I'm going to be talking about Black Lake and specifically to spray or not to spray. So that's more towards the end of my presentation. So at first I'm going to give you a bit of background about black legs. So you'll have to bear with me through that part first. 
Um, black leg is caused by a pathogen called Leptospheria maculans. And what's unique about this disease, especially when comparing it to a different tunnel disease like Sclerotinia, is that it can infect throughout the year. And this is because it infects via ascospores as well as pycnidiospores. And the pycnidiospores themselves can actually act in harsher conditions. However, the ascospores are what initially infect the plants. So they're produced on parathesia, that is what's on the stubble. So this is a picture of canola stubble. The stubble is actually two years old, and you can see all these black bumps, and that's the parathesia. They're going to produce the ascospores, which initially infect the canola plants, which can infect at an early stage. It just uh, needs a moisture event in order to infect. Now, once the canola is infected, um, lesions will form on the leaves as well as the stems, and these lesions will have these black peppering of spots, and that's what will produce the pycnidiospores that can continue to infect the plants uh, throughout the year. So as I mentioned before, these pycnidiospores can act in harsher conditions. So while you do need um, you know, a strong moisture and then to uh, initially infect the plants, it can be a bit drier and, and a range of temperatures in order for the pycnidiospores to continually infect throughout the season. Um, it's also important to note that wounding makes plants more susceptible to black legs. So Lionel mentioned before that there was some hail damage in the area. So hail damage, frost damage, and insect damage kind of all just creates an entry point for uh, the pathogen to infect. So what has black leg been like in Manitoba over the past five years? Um, the prevalence has been steady. So this is data taken from the Canola Disease Survey over the last five years. And it's just looking at the infection of black leg, the percent of the surveyed fields that showed an infection. So it's broken up here into stem lesions as well as basal lesions, which are at the base of the stems. But overall, you can see it's been more or less steady. And this is important to think about because over the last five years, um, we've obviously had a range of weather conditions, whereas 2011 was a lot drier than maybe some of the previous years. You can see that um, that didn't really change the amount of infection that we saw across the province. So it's important to know, something like sclerotinia we really think about as being weather dependent and we really need humid and, and moist conditions at flowering in order for it to infect. Black leg isn't as weather dependent. So this part I'm talking about the percent of survey fields with infection, but we also look at the percent of plants in those fields, the infected fields that uh, show infection. So that's actually where things are on the rise, where over the last five years, about the same percentage of fields have shown infection. Now when we see infection, it's to a greater extent. So five years ago, it was 5% or around 5%, and now we're getting up to the 10 to 15% range. So this is when we see infection in the field, it's now a greater portion of the field that's infected, and therefore can have a greater effect on the yield. Um, so the management tools, the number one thing, of course, is scouting. So the, and what's important with any of these is knowing what it looks like, knowing that you have it so that you can actually implement these management tools. So knowledge is power. So what does black leg look like? Uh, the leaf symptoms are basically these um, irregularly shaped lesions on the leaves. They can be, you can see them as early as cotyledon stage, although you're more likely to see them later. And these lesions will always have these black peppering of spots, which are, as I mentioned before, the pycnidia. Um, you can also see lesions on the stems. So you'll have these longitudinal um, gray colored kind of lesions, almost like bleaching sometimes. And then occasionally on the stems as well, you will see these pycnidia. When you cut open these stems, you will often see discoloration in the cross section. And at the, especially at the base of the stems, you don't necessarily need to see a lesion, but I would encourage you to go out, the, out there and and cut open some randomly selected stems just to see, because you can see this discoloration without seeing a, a lesion on the outside. So it's important when you're scouting just not to look just at the plants that look sick, but to just randomly select plants and cut them open to see what you see in the cross section. Also, it's important to know that there are some diseases out there that uh, look like black legs. So one of these is Alternaria black spot. So as you can see on the leaves, 
uh, these lesions can look fairly similar. Um, they can be similar in color as well as in shape. However, with black leg, you will always see the black peppering of spots within the lesion, and you won't see that with alternaria. I'm sure many of you are familiar with alternaria or have seen it in your fields before. It's relatively common and can occur in patches. You can see it on the leaves as well as on the pods. Uh, generally, uh, not of econ economic importance. You'll just see a few patches, but it's not going to be yield limiting. So it's important to know the difference between these two. Another look-alike disease is gray stem. So this picture is showing black leg symptoms and gray stem symptoms. So the black leg symptoms are actually these ones on the left where you see these basal lesions. And you can't really tell here, but if you cut these open at the base, you'll be able to see discoloration in the cross section. And on the right here, we have gray stem. So although gray stem looks a lot more scary in this picture, it actually shows up uh, post swathing So this is a disease that comes in after the crop has already ripened and the yield has already been determined. However, it can occur in patches in your field. And if you're walking through the field after swathing and you see a big patch that looks like this, it can look quite devastating. But um, cut open these stems, they'll most likely be hollow and brittle, whereas these stems will still be intact and we'll be able to show you the discoloration. If you see these hollow and brittle stems, it's most likely gray stem that came in post swathing as I mentioned, and it didn't have an effect on the yield. So another management tool is rotation. Greater than three years is ideal, and this is really the number one tool for black leg management. Uh, this graph is taking data from the Canola Disease Survey, and this information is a bit older, and I'm hoping to update it. But as you can see, they're looking at both the incidence of claritinia as well as the incidence of black leg, and then the frequency of canola in the rotation. So a one frequency means canola back to back. Two is one year between canola crops, and so on. And you see sclerotinia pretty similar from year to year. Although I'm not really talking about sclerotinia today, that's the reason that this is is because it survives for a long time in the soil, and also the sclerotinia spores can travel over long distances. So even if you have a good rotation, um, there could be infection in your neighbor's fields or a field down the road that could be causing infection of sclerotinia in your field. Black leg is more of a localized response, and therefore rotation in your field can really have an effect on the black, black leg populations. So as you can see, it's a steady decrease, and although we say three or more years, you know, really the longer the better as far as black leg is concerned. Now it's important to note that this is data from the disease survey, so it's not an equal number of fields for each of these frequencies. It's however many fields happened to have a one year or black or canola back to back, which obviously will most likely be uh, a lower number than the number of fields that have one year in between or two years in between. So keep that in mind. But it's still important information to have. Um, another management tool, of course, is choosing resistant varieties as well as rotating that resistance. As we know, the reason that black leg is showing up so much is because we are seeing a breakdown in resistance. Uh, this population has become uh, quite able to overcome genetic resistance, and that's because even when we have resistance to a disease, the disease is still able to infect at a low level. So although we have good resistance, you're still having small populations out there that are, are shifting and trying to get around this resistance. So the current rating system we have for our canola varieties, as far as black leg is concerned, is outdated. There are more races of the pathogen than the current system accounts for. So although you do have uh, ratings given for black leg, they may not always be that accurate depending on the area of the prairies that you live in and what races are present. So we definitely need a new system, and research is currently being done at the U of M to identify races of black leg that are present in different areas and hoping to match this up with resistant genes that are in the different varieties so that we can tell growers in certain areas what resistance will work for them. However, we don't always know what resistance genes are in what varieties. 
And this is something that we're hoping to work towards by working with seed companies and being able to develop a system, maybe something similar to what we see with herbicides or fungicides, where we have you know, groups that these fungicides fall into group 3, these fungicides fall into group 11, and so on. In Australia, they have done this for the canola varieties and black leg because they have had major black leg outbreaks there. And what they do is they have varieties that fall under a certain group and different varieties that fall in another group. And then you can at least know, you know, I grew this type of group last year. Uh, the next time I grow canola on this field, I'm going to grow a variety from a different group. Similar to what we do with rotating our fungicides and herbicides, hopefully be able to rotate um, our resistance. However, we do not have this information currently in Canada, so the best option we have right now is rotate varieties. You may have a variety that has worked for you in the past and you've gotten good yields and you want to stick with that variety, but unlike you, the pathogen is not afraid to change and it may start to overcome that type of resistance. So although we can't be sure that we're rotating our resistance, if you're not rotating your variety, you're definitely not rotating the resistance. So the best you can do right now is rotate our variety. And the next management tool, of course, is the fungicide application, which is the main reason that Lionel asked me to speak today. So to spray or not to spray? There are a number of things you need to consider. The first being, is it registered? So there are some products that are registered for black leg on canola at that early stage. So the two to six leaf, I believe, is what uh, most labels indicate. Uh, the propiconazole fungicide, so bumper, pivot, propel, and tilt. Uh, these are group three fungicides. They are registered for black leg on canola. And then group 11, quadrus, and headline are also registered. Uh, field history is another important one. Have you had previous issues with black leg? Scout your stubble. Look for those parathesia if you don't know if you've had previous issues. And rotation is definitely your best option. I mentioned that before. That's the number one management tool we have against uh, black leg. However, if you still choose to have a short rotation, you know, maybe you're just looking at the economics of it and it makes the most sense, which I, a lot of guys out there do that, then this may be an instance, you know, if you have had black leg before and you're pushing your rotation, that may be an instance where I would recommend a fungicide spray at that early timing. Other things to consider um, is your risk management. Is it going to pay off? Do, we, do you know that? What level of risk are you comfortable with? This will be different for different growers, and it will be different year to year depending on what the crop looks like. If you're unsure, um, definitely leave a test strip. For all guys who are sitting on the fence about whether or not to do this, either only spray a test strip, or if you do decide to spray, leave a check just so that you can compare the yield. Another thing is resistance management. As I mentioned before, we talked about the, fungus, or the pathogen shifting to overcome genetic resistance, but the pathogen can also shift to overcome uh, fungicides and develop a resistance to fungicides. So if you do make the decision to spray, consider rotating the fungicide groups. As I mentioned, there's both group 3 and group 11 fungicides that are currently registered for black leg. So if you decide to spray the same field again or a neighboring field and you sprayed it the last time you grew canola, consider spraying a different fungicide. And it's important to know that this fungicide application will not provide season-long control. It is registered at that early timing because that's really the best chance of, of getting to the part of the crop that is infected. As the crop grows up and fills in, um, you most likely won't be able to access the areas that will get infected by this disease. That's why it's only recommended at the early timing. Um, however, it's only going to provide you two or three weeks of control. So it'll give your plants maybe a bit of a head start depending on the disease pressure in your field. So it's important to continue to scout for symptoms. Even after, even if you decide to make a, an application at that early timing, scout, especially after swapping. You get off uh, the swather, take a walk around, randomly select stems, cut them open at the base just to see if you do have a black leg problem so that you know for future management. And that's all I have.
Uh, any questions for Ali, Linda? No, not at this time, Lionel. Okay, uh, so Holly, I got one question for you here. Um, so regarding spraying then, um, so if a producer has got a good rotation and uh, has no previous experience of uh, black leg on issue, uh, probably the test strip would be the way to go then if he's interested in spraying. If he's decided to spray them, yeah, I would definitely recommend leaving a test strip just so that he can see whether he's getting a payoff from it or not. It's important to know too that as we know, fungicide sometimes has benefits or they've seen yield responses not related to disease pressure. So it's important to know even if you're leaving a test strip to consider the disease pressure in your field. And if you are seeing a yield bump, maybe it's not just due to a, a black light control. Okay. Good. Well, uh, thanks, Holly. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, if you could give me the, the screen back. Great. One more thing I wanted to mention today was uh, I got a uh, email from Ingrid Christensen, and she's the FPA at Morris, and she put together some good information on frequently asked sprayer questions. Uh, she's got this information from uh, another colleague and uh, I, we have it available at the office here or it's probably a bit she forwarded it to all the FDA so if you have sprayer questions and uh, we've been getting a couple of them coming through the office regarding nozzles and uh, and uh, you know so there was some really good information in in this package so uh, if you've got uh, if you got questions or you got producers that have questions uh, then uh, give the office a call and we can forward you this information. One more thing um, regarding the question of uh, liberty and thesis. Um, I guess this, from everything I, I understand about the two products, uh, it's not a registered tank mix, so uh, you would probably be best to talk to your, uh, uh, your, your, your chem dealer or, or your uh, or the rep from uh, from Liberty, but uh, just one comment regarding what you're trying to control. Um, cutworms are usually best sprayed in the evening because during the heat of the day they will go down in the soil. So to get good control of cutworms, you probably should be spraying later in the evenings. Liberty, on the other hand, works better in daylight and sunlight. Uh, so you want to be spraying Liberty when you've got, uh, um, you know, a few hours of sunlight uh, after spraying because it just the product works better uh, that way. So you're kind of hitting, uh, you might lose some control with one or the other. If you're going to spray all day, you definitely aren't going to get uh, much uh, control on the cutworms besides some residual that will be left on the plant. And um, if you spray in the evening, then you're probably not going to get as good a control of the Liberty as you're, you're hoping for. So I guess that would be my concern there. And then regarding the tank mix, it's probably uh, best to contact the, uh, the rep for, uh, for Liberty to, uh, to determine that one. Uh, and I guess that's regarding that question. Is there any other questions, Linda? No, I don't have any questions right now, Lionel. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank John and Holly for being on today to give us some update information on a couple of the things that uh, uh, concerns we've been having over the last week regarding uh, insects and some disease. So uh, thanks to both of them. If you've uh, got any questions uh, or if you've got an answer for the weed question I put out there, uh, for identification. Uh, if you could let us know, here's our contact information at the office. And uh, then uh, this is the contact information for the FPAs in the Southwest and the South Parkland. And just a note, as you can see, Andrea Arbuckle is now going to be our FPA out of the Verdon area. So if you're in that area, we have uh, an FPA that will be starting there 
I think shortly, if not on Monday. So uh, if, uh, I guess with that, I'll end the webinar for today and see everybody next week.